Hi guys, good morning. Good afternoon, I mean. Um, so good to be here with you. Um, Jason just talked about Lauren Hill. I, I got to go with Malika this past week to see Lauren Hill. Dang, she's still fire, you guys. She is fire. She straight preached it, I mean, brought it to the Hollywood Bowl. She played no games. I love that woman. Anyways, side note, not a part of the sermon. She's still fire. She's a boss. Anyways, um, well, this morning we um, are going to begin a new series here at Expression. We talked about this um, a couple months ago that we would be doing this in the fall, and here we are. We are going to be, ta- this is called Foundations, and we're going to be taking the next six to eight weeks to look at biblical theology. Don't be scared. We're going to be talking about understanding, you know, the core Christian concepts. Um, and our heart in this one is that we would obviously know the truth and be aligned with what the Bible has to say, but also we'd really be able to communicate that and um, to others. And most of us know, know the scriptures that, that tell us to love God with all of our heart and our soul and our mind. And for some of us, it's, it might be easier to get our heads around loving God with our heart, loving God with our soul. But what does it really look like to love God with your mind? Your mind was not supposed to be checked out of the equation. And so loving God with your mind, giving God your heart, your soul, and your mind looks like coming into alignment with the truth and um, you, using our mind. And I think sometimes um, there's a bit of a perception. I'll be honest. You guys know that I'm always honest. Um, that, that some people really look at Christians as just idiots. That's the truth. Um, I recently had a conversation with a former Muslim woman who was um, sharing with me um, about her perception and, and the Muslim community that she'd come from, their perception of Christians. And she just said, you know, we just looked at you guys like, you don't even know what you're talking about. She said, every Christian I met, they couldn't explain what they really believed. They didn't really know theology. She said, you know, when you're talking about Muslim faith or Jewish faith, from a young child, we're taught theology. We memorize scripture. We understand what we believe. And she said, and so many Christians I would meet couldn't explain to me the basics of what they believed. And so they just looked foolish to me. And... Um, and so our heart really in this, as we're on this quest and this journey together, is one that we would be deeply rooted in um, understanding the kingdom, understanding who our God is, but also that we'd have tools to be able to communicate it in a really effective way. Um, and so I think sometimes when people think about theology, they kind of think of this like abstract, like really academic, hard to get your head around. And so maybe we say things to somebody who maybe asks about our faith, like, I don't know, I mean, he's just really good. You should love him, you know? And that might work for somebody, but that's not gonna work for a lot of people, you know? And so we're gonna be taking the next six to eight weeks to really look at um, who is God, understanding the gospel, heaven, hell, sin, the, the, word of the, the word of God, you know, the church, like all some basic theology, what's next, how do we live, who are we, you know, just looking at basic theology, and um, my heart is that we can all walk away with some really good tools to um, be able to communicate, communicate authentically um, about what we believe. Does that sound good? If not, see you later. Um, (laughs) I don't know what to tell you. Um, (laughs) You know, I did some research, and it was actually quite alarming to me. Um, Lifeway Research recently did some studies on 3,000 adult Americans. And the study focused on key theological areas of the faith and revealed that there are several areas where American Christians differ from Orthodox Christianity beliefs. And um, when I say Orthodox, I'm not, you know... It's not like some weird sect of Christianity. I'm talking about like foundational biblical beliefs. Um, Almost half of Americans, 45%, but believe that there are many ways to get to heaven. The same percentage say the Bible was written for everybody to interpret as he or she chooses. That's so convenient. I mean, I get it. I get it. Like, wow, that'd be nice. Um, 
That is not what the Bible says. Okay, um, more than half, 59% actually, so almost 60% um, of evangelicals believe the Holy Spirit is a force and not an equal entity of the Trinity. It's just like a ghost or something out there. May the force be with you. Like something out there and not an equal um, part of the Trinity. And 29% of evangelicals believe God the Father is more divine than Jesus. So where are Americans, and especially evangelicals, where are they getting their theology? I'm not gonna answer that because I don't know. But (laughs) human beings did not invent God. And because God exists independently from us, it would it makes sense for us to come to God and his word for definitions of who he is, right? We don't just get to make those up. And so theology doesn't originate in human thought. It originates in who God says he is. And um, our heart really is that we would be a community that is deeply rooted in good theology and can turn around and really communicate. Actually, some of that research that was, was, as I was studying that, I, I forgot to grab the, the actual percentage, I think if I, I think it's 48% um, of Christians today say that it's, it's not appropriate or moral to share your faith with somebody. I mean, part of me is kind of like, that's kind of good because they've got some really weird theology, so maybe they shouldn't be sharing it. But <laughs> the other part of me is like, what's happening, right? <laughs> what's happening? Like, when we don't understand the reality of these things, it's so easy for us to kind of just get into this own little world we create for ourselves and forget that we are vessels for the gospel to go through, that we, we are ambassadors for the kingdom of God on this earth. And so um, we're, gonna be, we're gonna be digging into it. Um, and so I wanna encourage you guys in the next couple weeks, come with something to take notes with. Um, Really, I don't want you to take what I say at face value. I want you to be a powerful, a powerful critical thinker who takes what I say and you're gonna go study it yourself is way too much of a burden for me to bear to think that I have to shape your theology for yourself. Like, I'm going to present to you the best I can with the fear of God, with what I can. We're gonna present to you biblical concepts, but you need to do the work to go back, look in scripture yourself. That's how you end up with these kind of statistics when people just believe what anybody tells them, right? So all of us are powerful, and we need to be in the word of God, and we need to study, and we need to to really understand what we believe, okay? And so theology in theory is having a word about God. It's just, and, and the reality is all of us are theologians. If you're a believer, you're a theologian. You have thoughts about God. You speak about God. So let's get those thoughts and our words in alignment with who he says he is, right? And so we're going on a journey together. Um, All right. I love this verse. It challenges me. Um, 1 Peter 3.15. But in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. Always be prepared to give an answer for the hope you have. Are we prepared? My hope is that if we're not, that we would be prepared to give an answer for the hope we have. And, um, and so we're going to be looking at... at theology, but we're also going to be even examining some historical evidence. And, you know, the reality is there's... There's a lot of different ways to angle this, and I'll be honest, it's gonna be hard to do each subject in a 45-minute time slot on a Sunday, which is why it, it's, you know, hopefully this is kind of just a starting ground for you to begin to dig into the word, begin to dig into conversations with people, and really get God's heart. Um, so I wanna start with just talking about what makes Christianity unique. Really, all major world religions can be boiled down to one of three different distinctions. Number one, either they offer a set of ideas or a system of thought. Number two, they offer some kind of emotional experience. Or number three, they offer a moral code or standards by which to live, behave. So really every kind of classical religion falls into one of those three categories. It's a school of thought, it's some kind of an emotional experience, or it's some kind of way to live. 
Christianity does not fit into any of those three. I mean, yes, those three happen in Christianity. But what sets Christianity apart is um, to become a Christian isn't merely to accept ideas or a system of thought. It's coming to meet the person of Jesus Christ. So Christianity isn't about what we believe. It's about who we believe. Very big difference. Um, It's not about a certain type of experience or some emotional encounter, even though there's nothing more life-changing than meeting Jesus. And it can't be reduced to do's and don'ts, even though Jesus told Christians they should be known for what they do. Jesus didn't come into this world claiming to give us new thoughts about God or to give us new experiences with God or to tell us to do things for God. Jesus came into this world as God. Big difference. Jesus came into this world as God. There is no other religion that claims that God came and put flesh on Emmanuel and came and lived amongst us. Jesus came as God. You with me? If you're talking with a Buddhist and you ask, did it have to be the Buddha who gave his Buddhism? Or theoretically, could it have been somebody else? Of course, they'll probably insist, well, it was the Buddha. He was enlightened, and um, he gave the system. But if you ask the question, yes, but did it have to be him? I mean, theoretically, couldn't somebody else have been enlightened and given the system? And they probably would respond, well, I guess in theory, yes, it didn't have to be him. Theoretically, it could have been somebody else who got enlightened and, and gave the system. Or if you asked a Muslim, did it have to be Muhammad? And, um, you know, prob- the, the response would probably be, um, well, he was the one whom the revelation was given, and he wrote it down. And if, once again, you were to say, yes, but could God, in theory, have chosen somebody else to give the revelation to? The answer would be, in theory, yes. But historically, it was him. So you can separate the person from the system. It does not work that way in Christianity. You cannot separate Christ from Christianity. There is no Christianity outside of Christ. You with me? Because Jesus came as God, not as a servant of God. He came as God. The Christian faith is rooted in being. There's no peers, there's no competitors. Um, I believe that there are a million paths to Jesus Christ. There are a million paths to Christ, but there's only one path between Jesus and God. There's only one path between Jesus and God. Lots of ways. We probably all have traveled different paths to get to Jesus. But Jesus is the only way to the Father. Chris, if you know, I want to just say this just kind of as we start off. If Christianity for you has only ever been a set of beliefs or some kind of emotional experience or just a list of moral rules to live by, I would like to challenge you to to begin to press in for um, a a real encounter and relationship with the living God. Because that is what sets Christianity apart from every other religion. A real encounter and relationship with the living God. And if maybe you're a non-believer, you're an atheist or, or somebody watching and you, you, you're, you, know, you don't believe in God, you're questioning this Christianity thing, I would encourage you in that. Don't just look to somebody who claims to have a, a school of thought, but they don't even really know what they believe. <laughs> don't just look to somebody who has, has had some kind of emotional experience, but they don't really even know how to live that out. Don't just look to somebody who is living by a list of do's and don'ts that they can't even keep themselves. Look to somebody whose life has been radically transformed by Jesus. Ask them questions. Talk to them. Don't write off Christianity because because of those other things. Like truly find somebody who has had an encounter with the living God. Because when you encounter God, when you encounter Jesus, your whole life will be changed. Every part of you. John 1, 4 says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was with God in the beginning. 
Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light for all mankind. John 3.36, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, but whoever rejects the Son will not see life, for God's wrath remains on them. Life is defined by knowing Jesus. Jesus defines meeting him not as a moment in life, but as life itself. Some people might say, well, you know, I'm happy with my life without God. Why do I need God? Well, the problem with that is that is based on a huge assumption that you actually have a life. Just because you're conscious and walking around biblically doesn't mean you're alive. Right? So Jesus didn't come to turn bad people into good people. He came to take dead people and make them alive, right? This is the truth. That's why Jesus is the only way to the Father. Jesus is life. You cannot get life without life. You cannot have life without life. There's only one door to go through for life, and it's life himself. Life is defined by knowing Jesus. Honestly, the biblical perspective is pretty radical when you think about it. Um, in John chapter 6, the disciples asked Jesus, what must we do to do the works, plural, the works God requires? Jesus answers in the singular, the work of God is this, to believe in the one whom he has sent. And they say, oh, hold on a second, I'm paraphrasing, hold on a second, our forefathers ate manna in the desert, like it rained bread. What kind of miracle are you going to do, Jesus, to prove that you're actually who you say you are? And he looks at them, once again, paraphrasing, and he's like, seriously? You're talking about crumbs that fell from the sky? I am the bread of life. I am. This isn't about what miracle. This is who I am. This isn't about what you believe, what you see. This is about who he is. Christianity isn't a set of beliefs. It's a person. It's knowing who God is. Everything else comes after that, but it's, it's having a revelation of who God is. Of course, in John 14, 6, he goes on to say, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. What sets Christianity apart from every other religion Religion. It's the only one that claims that God took on human flesh and came and dwelt among us. That he paid the price for our sin. It's not just a school of thought. It's not an emotional experience. It's not a moral code. It's who. Who he is. Who we believe. You know, other religions, um, particularly Muslims, you know, for sure, will believe that, a lot of people do, that we've taken... Um, a man, Jesus, and tried to elevate him and worship him as God. And how can that be? Because you can't take a man and make him God. But honestly, it's asking the wrong question. It's not, could a man become God? But the question is, could God become man if he wanted to? And the Bible, uh, the God described in the Bible is very relational. The God of the Bible can be known the God of the Bible is described as being love in his very nature. When you look back to that God of the Bible's history and dealings with the human race, you'll see that he always stepped into human history. You'll see the God of the Bible walked in the garden with Adam and Eve. You'll see the God of the Bible walking with, with Abraham and Moses. You see the God of the Bible consistently interacting and being very present in the human story. So it's not a huge leap of thought to think that a God whose very essence is love, that a God who's completely and absolutely relational, that a God who has been deeply, intricately involved in the human story would make the choice to take on flesh and live amongst us, to save us, to redeem us, to bring us in, to eternally secure us in relation, right relationship with him. You see, maybe somebody of another religion would say, God loves. 
But the radical difference is in Christianity, it's not that God loves, it's that God is love. God is love. It's not something he does, it's who he is. A God of love put on flesh and came to take our place. So, who is God? Just a very light subject we're gonna try to tackle this morning. <laughs> who is God? Um, <laughs> Let me just start by saying this. When I was first pregnant with my first child, you know, you do the things you do. You, like, read all the books. You ask all the questions. You watch other moms. You study them. You ask, you know, you do learn all the things. You learn all the things you're supposed to do in labor. You learn, you know, you just, you know, you think, okay, I've got all this information. I have read all this stuff. I've been to all the classes. I've watched, I've babysat for a thousand years. I got it. Nothing can prepare you. Mom's parents know this. Nothing can prepare you for what it's actually like to experience it for yourself, right? And so nothing I read could prepare me for labor. Nothing. It's all lies. It's all lies, all of it. <laughs> bunch of freaking lies. Um, no, nothing could have prepared me. Now, granted, I had really different labors than most, so there's that. But my first baby was born in 45 minutes. My second baby was born in 25 minutes. So that might sound awesome. It's not. For the record, that's called a medical emergency. The body was not made to do that. It was no fun. Okay. Thought I was going to die. Nothing I read prepared me for that. And then, you know, Nothing I read also could ever prepare me for the joy of what it is to have children and the challenge and the complexity of emotions and how rewarding and how, like, nothing could, you know, could, all the information could not compare to the experience, right? And that's a very human experience. How much more when trying to get your head wrapped around the divine, I mean, I feel like trying to understand God, if we have all the right answers and we can put them in a little box and we're like, Trinity, I got it, it's easy. Like, if, we, if it's just all easy for you, I don't know. Like, I don't know if we're seeing God all the way. I'm really glad that God is not on my level. We'd have problems if he was on my level, right? I am really glad that God is big and huge and complex and fascinating and majestic and, and sovereign and that it's like, here I am, this like little one-dimensional person trying to get my head wrapped around this like 60 million dimension person. And so as we kind of look at this this morning and kind of examine this, keep that in mind. Don't be frustrated if you're like, oh, this is complex. And I, I think there's something really beautiful about that. I think there's something beautiful about the mystery and the complexities of God. We are, you know, it's like if I took a picture of a computer and I put it on the screen, I said, look at this image. It's a computer. Now, the image is definitely not as complex as the thing it's the image of, right? A picture of a computer is not as complex as the computer. I feel like many times we're, we're the picture of the computer because we're made in the image of God, and we're trying to understand all the in, like, ins and outs of how the computer works, and we're like, we're just a picture, I don't know. Okay, so as we look at this and we begin to, you know, dig into this, be okay with mystery. That actually makes me love him more and trust him more. I don't know about you, but I'm pretty glad that I can't, I don't have them all figured out. Um, okay, I'm gonna make a big theological statement and we're gonna break it down. Don't be overwhelmed by this statement, but I want to um, kind of give you some perspective, and then we're going to break this hopefully into some practical language for you. Okay, you ready? It's, I think we've got it for you on the screen. There is one God who coexists eternally in three distinct persons who are co-equal. There is one God who coexists eternally in three distinct persons who are co-equal. God is one in being and three in person. That is not a contradiction. Now, if the word person throws you off, you can change it with entity. You can change it with something else. You're free. There's no, like, you know, um, there's, there's freedom here. But what's the difference between a being and a person? A being is that quality that makes someone what they are. A being is whatness, and a person is who, who you are. 
What am I? I am a human being. Who am I? I'm Jennifer Toledo. What am I? I am flesh and bones and hair and skin. Who am I? A beautiful, smart, wonderful, amazing, powerful woman. <laughs> Since you asked. Um, your whatness and your whoness are different. Does that make sense? What are you and who are you? What is God? God is one God. Who is God? He is Father, He is Son, He is Holy Spirit. Now, it's a little hard for us because we look at it from a I am one what and one who, trying to look at one what and three who's. <laughs> but if you think about it, I mean, aren't we kind of three who's anyway? We're body, soul, and spirit. As long as you've been alive, you've been body, soul, and spirit. And your whole life, your body, soul, and spirit are all going to be working together. So maybe that kind of helps this concept of I am a body, I am a soul, and I am a spirit. And together, they make up me. Okay, so maybe that, that kind of helps with the concept of God is one being with three distinct entities, persons, parts. Is that helpful? Um, Okay, those three people, those three parts, those three entities um, are all equal because they've all existed from the beginning. We, we read that in John 1, and they're all God. So the doctrine of the Trinity forces us to explore just how huge the God of the Bible is. He's a father and creator. He's a, the son, the redeemer, and he's the spirit, the sustainer. And he's all three of those things all the time. I want you to hear this statement. I'm going to read it because I don't want to mess it up. But I think it defines it well. The Godhead is the perfect community of one who out of the overflow of his own delight, perfection, and joy within himself created all that is. The basis of the universe is glad-filled joy because of the powerful love that exists in the Godhead. The claim that God is love is the essence of the Trinity. The very essence of the Trinity is that God is love. And out of that love came us. So we're going to take that big statement, and we're going to take it bit by bit, okay? So there is one God who coexists eternally and three distinct persons who are co-equal. Number one, there is one God. Everybody say one God. One God. Not three gods. One God. There is one God. Deuteronomy 6, 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. This passage is called the Shema, which um, every Hebrew was taught to recite in the morning and in the evening. To deny that there is only one God is what we call a polytheist. It's somebody who believes in multiple gods. Because Judaism was a monotheistic religion and Christianity was birthed out of or emerged out of the Jewish faith, Christians also subscribe to the fact that there is one God. Now, this is where the Mormon faith really differs uh, from the Christian faith. Um, because they believe that humans can ascend to become a god. Christians don't believe that. There's only one god. Um, the word, this is very interesting. The word used for one in this passage isn't one of mathematical singularity. In fact, it's the same word used in Genesis 2.24, where Adam and Eve, two separate people, are said to be one. The same word for Adam and Eve being one is the same word for hero Israel, the Lord your God is one. This is a word about unity, being separate forces, people that are unified as one. Okay? Um, they're not one in person, but they're one in essence, one in nature. Um, 1 John 5, 7 for there are three that bear witness in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit, and all these three are one. That's a different translation. 
I like mine better. Um, <laughs> sorry, guys, I probably didn't give you the <laughs> translation I was using. Um, you may remember where Jesus in, in John 10.30 said, I and the Father are one. Remember that? It almost got him killed. So there is only one God. Number two, there is only one God who coexists eternally. There was never a time in the past or in the future that God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit did not exist. This is another place that Mormons and Jehovah Witnesses deviate from the Christian doctrine because they do not believe that Jesus is eternal, but rather that he was created by God. He's a created being, which is a direct violation of the word of God. So they're all coexisting at the same time. Now, a couple of centuries ago, people came up with some theory called modalism where you know, God could only be in one mode at a time. I don't know about you, I actually believed this for a while as a child. I thought God was just like the father for like a whole long time. And then all of a sudden he became Jesus for a whole long time. And now he's the Holy Spirit for a whole long time. And that God just morphed himself. I thought that for a long time. And then I was like, oh, that's not really theologically correct. Um, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit have always coexisted eternally. They've all three been present, always. Jesus is not a created being, okay? All three have coexisted eternally. I'm gonna give you some examples. In creation, the very first scripture in your Bible says, in the beginning, God created, right? Do you know that the word used for God in that passage is Elohim, the Hebrew word Elohim. It is plural. It is the plural form of God. In the beginning, God and all that he is, all the parts of God, created. In the beginning, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit created. You see all throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament, you know, the three at work. I'll give you two more examples. Um, do you remember the time when Jesus is being baptized? And here you have the Son in the flesh being baptized. And as he's baptized, the voice of the Father bellows down from heaven, this is my Son in whom I'm well pleased. And then the Holy Spirit shows up like a dove, all three present in one moment. So God didn't have to jump into the phone booth and change himself into the Holy Spirit to come out and then go back in and change himself and come out in his Jesus cape. Like, all three exist eternally, right? Another example of this is Stephen in the Bible. If you remember, Stephen, the disciple, he's about to be stoned. And um, Acts 7, 55 and 56 it says, but Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. You've got Stephen full of the Holy Spirit. He looks up, he sees the Father, and he sees the Son. And everybody's like, we're all good. We're all here. <laughs> Together, eternally, here, right? So, there's only one God who coexists eternally in three distinct persons. This is number three, in three distinct persons. This means that God the Father is distinct or different than God the Son, who is different or distinct from God the Holy Spirit. So, different persons, but all members of the Godhead. Now, the Holy Spirit is not a thing. It's not an it. Um... He is an equal, powerful person entity in the Trinity. We're told in Scripture that the Holy Spirit speaks to us, in John 14, 26, and that he can be grieved, Ephesians 4, 30. God is not one person who morphs in nature, depending on the situation. He is one being with three distinct entities, very distinct, each one, all the time. And then number four, there's only one God who coexists eternally in three distinct persons who are co-equal. The Trinity is not compromised of a hierarchy. 
It's not like God's the boss, Jesus is the assistant, and the Holy Spirit's the intern. That is not what that is. You're talking about three parts of God. All are God, all are powerful, all are good. They are co-equal. Now they have different roles, absolutely, but they are n- none of them is more God than the other. Does that make sense? Equal in their essence, equal in their godness. They've all existed from the beginning. They all carry the nature and essence of God because they are God. Now, here was maybe where you'll encounter some challenge. If the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are equal, equally God, why is it that Jesus said, the Father is greater than I? In John 14, 28. Now, this this passage where Jesus says this was spoken by Jesus during the upper room discourse, if you remember this this in the story, but um, the context of promising the Holy Spirit, and he's talking to the disciples after the resurrection. And Jesus says repeatedly, repeatedly that he's doing the Father's will, which thereby is pretty much implying that he is somehow subservient to the Father's will, right? The question then becomes, how can Jesus be equal to God when by his own admission, he is, he is subservient to the will of God? You tracking with me? So we were like, dang, I should have had more coffee. <laughs> I want you to get your head around this, okay? Because... If you were having a conversation with me, I would have asked you this. I would have. I'd been like, so you say the Father, the Son, the Spirit are equal. Why did Jesus say this? I mean, I would want you to be able to explain that to me. I'm going to do my best to try to give you some perspective on that. But um, I really think the answer to this lies in understanding of the incarnation because during the incarnation, Jesus was temporarily made lower than the angels. We're told that in scripture. Hebrews 2.9, Jesus made the angels. The word was present when all things were created, right? Yes, hello, are you with me? <laughs> Some of you are like, and I share. It says that when Jesus took on flesh as a human, He didn't let go of his godness. He was still divinely God, but he also took on the flesh of humanity. And when he did that, it says he was made temporarily lower than the angels, which refers to his status, not his essence, not his nature, his status. Now, the doctrine of the incarnation says that the second person of the Trinity took on human flesh. Therefore, for all intents and purposes, Jesus was fully human and made lower than the angels. However, he's still fully divine. By taking on human nature, Jesus didn't relinquish his divine nature. He can't stop being God. So how do we reconcile this? I think the answer is in Philippians 2, 5 through 11. You can read that on your own and study it. When the second person of the Trinity took on human form, something amazing occurred. Christ, it says, made himself nothing. Jesus made himself nothing. In essence, it means that Jesus voluntarily relinquished, right, the prerogative of freely exercising his divine attributes and subjected himself to the will of the Father while on the earth. So while Jesus was on the earth, he chose to let go. He chose to, yes, he's fully God, but he chose to to take on the role of human. And in that place, in that status as human, The right posture is to be in full submission to God. It's not about his will, it's about the Father's will. And he modeled for us how to do that. So he's not less God, he's not somehow less God. In that status where he empties himself and he takes on humanity, and it says in in Philippians, because he did that, read that, right? He is exalted to the highest place. So, Chew on that, think about that. But here's some um, verses. I would encourage you to take a picture of this because we're not going to read through those. If this, when I say I want you to study this for yourself, there's a little cheat sheet. Take a picture of it, read those verses yourself. You come to your own conclusion. 
Here's verses about there is one God. The Father is God. The Son is God. The Holy Spirit is God. You know, three distinct persons, whatever. You can look at those, study them yourself. Um, draw your own conclusions with the Holy Spirit. Highly recommend you invite him into that process. And um, hashtag don't get weird. Um, <laughs> But chew on these for yourself. Now, I, I want to give, some of you guys have probably heard different examples of trying to explain the Trinity. I think sometimes examples are helpful. I think sometimes, I actually think all the time it's better to have good theology and then maybe use an example to back it up than just to use an example and try to build some theology around it. But some examples you might have heard. Um, anybody heard the water example with the Trinity? It's, yeah. Um, H2O retains its chemical activity whether it's in the solid form, the gas form, or the liquid form, it's still water, just different forms. And actually, um, there's a condition, it's called a triple point for water, because I'm sure we all knew that. Um, there's a condition under which ice, steam, and liquid water can coexist in equilibrium. All are water, yet they all have their distinct form. Um, another example I like, I like personally, is the sun example. Um, nobody has actually seen the sun. You can't actually stare into the sun unless you want to be blind. Um, no one has actually seen the sun in its fullness, just as no one can actually see the Father in his fullness. What, how do we know about the sun? Because we, we see its light. We see the rays of light that come from it, and that tells us a lot about the sun. How do we know about the Father? We see Jesus. We see the light in Jesus. We learn about the Father through Jesus. And then, like the sun, the, you know, the, the work of the sun, maybe you can't see it, but you see the evidence of the work of the sun. You see seeds that begin to grow, right? The sun nourishes the ground, and seeds begin to grow. Plants begin to grow. Or you feel the warmth of the sun on your skin. That's like the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is actively growing and, and working and nourishing, and sometimes you can feel the Holy Spirit or whatever, but all of those, you know, when you think about the sun itself, you think about the rays of light from the sun, you think about the work of the sun, um, kind of can give you a picture a little bit of how the Trinity works. Does that help a little bit? Okay, the rest of you are like, nope. Um, <laughs> cool. Um, okay. So understanding this, that what sets Christianity apart is that God himself, a God of love, the second person in the Trinity, took on flesh and came to the earth as God to take our place, to redeem us, to eternally secure us in love. And our God is this wildly complex, powerful being who happens to also be, which is pretty great, um, omnipotent. His omnipotence means that God is all-powerful and able to do anything consistent with his own nature. Our God is all-powerful. He's omnipresent. His omnipresence means that God is present everywhere with his whole being at all times. No matter where you go, no matter what you're doing, no matter if you find yourself in the pits of life, God is present. God is omniscient. His omniscience means that God knows everything, actual and possible, effortlessly and equally well. It's also comforting that the God who wants relationship with you knows all things, knows the future. He knows all things. That's pretty comforting. And it also blows my mind that a God so majestic and so sovereign and so holy and so powerful wants relationship with me and has created a direct access for each one of us to have direct relationship with God. You don't need to go through somebody else. You can have direct, that's what Jesus did, right? On the cross, the veil was torn. We now have direct access to God. That God, that God of love, that trinity that beautiful trinity of love. And we are invited into eternally fellowshipping and staying in that place of love and relationship with that powerful God. That's pretty incredible.
Let's just do this for a moment. Will you turn your attention to the screens? Hang in with me for this video. It's a little funky at the end. It just cuts off weird, but good old Billy Graham. I mean, who needs some good old Billy Graham on a Sunday morning? Yes. Okay, turn your attention towards the screen. So good. Will you stand with me as we close? I'm going to invite our ministry team to come forward. My prayer is that we would be a community of people that don't just prescribe to a school of thought, that don't just know some kind of emotional experience, that don't just merely believe in a list of do's and don'ts, but that we would be a community of people, all of us, who truly have encountered the God of love, truly experiencing him. Will you close your eyes with me? God, we want to know you. God, we're so grateful. We are so grateful, Lord, that you came to take judgment for us. That blows my mind, God. We don't deserve it. We certainly haven't earned it. God, your love is unfathomable. God, we want to encounter you. We want to know you, God. And Lord, we want our lives to be a springboard for others to encounter you and know you. God, would you move us past just empty religion, Lord? Would you move us into the kind of divine relationship we're invited into with you? God, we're so grateful that you would come and live amongst us and take our place. God, we're so grateful that you had a plan for our mess. And God, for anybody in this room who's currently feeling the weight of their mess, I thank you, God, that you have a plan. God, I pray that the revelation of who you are would go so deep in us. Just stay in this place with your eyes closed for a minute. I want to just take an opportunity if there's anybody here today that would say, I need, to, I need to know God for real. Maybe you've had just thoughts about God or some kind of emotional thing or maybe you've tried to live by a moral code, but you're saying, I need to truly experience who God is. I need Jesus to take my place. I need, I want to truly be in right relationship with God. If that's you, I want to pray for you this morning. As everybody's just in this place of just reverence before the Lord, if that's you, just slip your hand up. I want to pray with you. Yeah. Yeah. Anybody else? Several people. Yep. Yeah. Let's just pray this together. Let's all pray this. God. We want to know you for real. We give you the space to do whatever you want to do in our life. I see how big you are. Jesus, thank you for taking my place. Thank you for coming for me. I want to know you for real on your terms. Jesus, I love you. I make you the Lord of my life. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, I want to encounter you. Have your way in me. Forgive me of doing it my own way. Forgive me for my sin. I receive your grace. I receive your mercy. I receive your gift to come near. I'm not going to stand on the outside anymore. I step into the fullness of what you did for me. 
In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, bless you. Um, If you would like prayer, our team is available up here. We would love to pray for you. Have an amazing week, and we'll see you next week.